Hi, Tom Andrews here today and I want to talk to you a little bit about routers. And the first thing I want to tell you is that there really are three different sizes of routers that we use today in the shop. We use um, monstrous routers and um, this one's in the three horsepower range for really large profile bits. And then there are some really nice handheld routers which are in the horse and a half range and then some of the new micro routers which are really, really nice to use. The first thing that I want to go over is how many different types of bits you can put in a router. And um, there are just a huge array of profiles and uh, that term profile is really kind of, if you think about um, if you ever get arrested and uh, you take a picture straight on and then you take the picture of a profile which shows the shape of your face. And so when you look at um, a router bit, or a profile cutter, really you're looking at the side edge of it. And so um, in, the, uh, in, in the literature, you'll be referred uh, using the term profile. So if you want to get a profile for a particular type of edge, there are so many different ways to, to look at it. For example, right here, these are referred to as quarter rounds and they cut a really nice round over um, and they come in a radius. And then there are different types of bits uh, called OGs, and these go way back in human history, and they cut some really cool looking little profiles and add some really neat architectural elements to your work. And uh, this is a little bit of a different type of OG. And um, this then is a chamfer bit that you can set to a different depth, and it just goes on and on. And over here we've got the larger stuff that we would use in a in in like making a raised panel door or a flat panel door and these are the different cutters that you would that you would install to do this and then this is called a fly cutter right here very very strong rigid bit and that's why we have the three horsepower routers so really no end it seems like to the opportunity uh, to, to put a really fancy edge on a product. When you select bits for your router, they really come in two different arbor diameters. And an arbor is the shaft, uh, and I'm, I'm gonna show you how to put them in the router, but they come in quarter inch and then they come in half inch. And um, presently, I'm really a fan of half inch routers. Even if I'm doing small work, this, the half inch router is a lot smoother. And um, this particular smaller shaped one uh, with a quarter inch arbor works a lot better in the little micro cutters. And it would be you'd be surprised at how easy and effective it is to cut using a micro router with actually a pretty, pretty large profile. Okay, um, one of the first things that I want you to be aware of is, is how to install a bit. And each router, uh, most all the new routers come with different collets and this is a quarter inch collet and I know this might drive some people crazy but um, I'm an old machinist and what uh, machinists know is that if you really want for your uh, to get maximum torque you need to um, utilize some lubricant on your threads and what that will do is it will help so that um, the, your threads don't actually bind uh, as you as you torque them down and so what you can see is that this is triangular shaped so that as it presses down on this collet it applies a pressure uh, to the to the shank of the bit and so as this bit sits in the collet and we crank that down it has to wedge into um, the router chuck or the collet and so I'm going to go ahead and pull this down. Now, one of the things that you need to kind of remember, a rule of thumb, is that we never pinch down where there's paint. So if your router profile has paint, you can kind of come to that edge. The other thing is we don't want to bottom the bit out. If we bottom the bit out, it will tend to vibrate up and out, no matter how tight you tighten it. So we want to go to the bottom of the travel, lift it up about a sixteenth of an inch, and then go ahead and begin to cinch that down. So when you go to tighten the collet, you don't need a massive amount of pressure. And so I like to use the wrenches in this type of a pattern, like this right here. And then when you get out to where you're firm, then you can squeeze the wrenches together. 
with one hand and not two. And that is really all that you need to do. You don't want to run these things dry. Many, many people will run uh, the machine screws dry and, and you won't get the compression that you want against the shaft if, if it's wedging and the steel won't slide on itself. That's why you want to lubricate uh, that collet and that tapered surface so that it can pull down in there and can apply maximum pressure uh, to the shank of that bit. I really recommend that when you uh, begin to acquire a number of profile bits and different style bits that you consider getting one of these boxes that uh, does such a great job of protecting the carbide surfaces on your bits. Um, carbide, when it gets up against other carbide edges, will fracture. It's very hard, um, but it's also brittle. And uh, so um, these boxes are from Rockler. They come with half inch and quarter inch holes. And so um, they, just, they just help you protect your bits while they're not in use. Something that I think will help you a lot uh, as you do different router profiles on different size of pieces is if you'll um, go someplace where they're recovering some uh, uh, some old carpeting and uh, you can actually just use great big pieces of this on tops of your tables and uh, if you if you put a, if you cover your table uh, with this like I usually have four foot by eight foot pieces this is a four foot by four foot piece you you don't need to worry about marring anything that you're working on and what's really nice about it is if you're going to do some type of type of coating uh, on your on your project it doesn't matter if you get that coating onto this rubberized surface but this rubberized surface provides a nice grip uh, and and keeps it, it'll hold pieces so that you can go ahead and work with them utilizing uh, your routers so what the first thing that uh, I want to show you is that on this router you this is called the rub ring and um, that rub ring has to spin and uh, it allows it to spin without burning the side of the piece of wood uh, as the profile makes its cut. So that rub ring needs to follow along this edge. The second thing is that we need to cut into the wood when we're doing that. And so we want the bit rotating into the wood and forward cutting as it exits the, exits the wood. And so we're always, always, always pushing against the, the direction of the profile bit. Now this little Bosch Colt is a fantastic little router. It's really designed for you to hold it right here on the rubber section and then your fingers can actually sit, uh, sit on the platform. And so you, they, that will help you keep this stable as you go ahead and make the cut. Now that went pretty well, uh, mostly because I didn't try to cut it all at one time. And so what I'm going to redo now is the depth. And so I'll set it for the final pass. I've lowered it so that we're going to take off the rest of the wood to make the final cut. So normally, you would have this monstrous router that you'd be trying to hold with two hands, and here you've got this micro router using a relatively large profile bit and cutting an absolutely perfect profile in that piece of wood. And so nowadays, rather than uh, use the big routers to do work like this, almost all of the work that we do can be done with one of these little routers and they're also called laminate routers but they are fantastic for handling even relatively large profile bits that you would use in a router. Now I've switched over to my favorite D-handle router and um, the D-handle router is used to with a profile bit and, and you're, you're doing it freehand in other words you're not on a router table and uh, to, to a lot of times there's a project like a like a tabletop, a big tabletop, and you just can't get that up on your router table, it's, which is normally what I would use um, to handle a bit of this type. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to adjust this bit 
so that we only really want to get this in about three passes. Um, I find that if you don't get it in about three passes that, um, that you wind up uh, running the risk of chipping. And so one of the things I want to tell you about a D-handle router is that it gives you a lot more control over this right here, which will really foul it, which will really foul up your profile. If you if you get this to where it's rocking down here and this isn't running, these two planes aren't right on top of each other, the base and the wood, then you your profile will not be, it won't cut accurately and you'll be very disappointed with it. So um, I, what I'm going to do is show you how to utilize this, this uh, D-handle router so that you can be more stable and keep the base plate uh, right exactly in contact with the wood surface. Now you can see that if you that, that my bit didn't precisely follow right along this edge and so you're going to make that type of a mistake when you use it so I tell everyone that it's very common for you to always make two passes whenever you're routering whether it's with a handheld router or whether you're on the router table so I'll go ahead and make that second pass One thing to keep in mind is that if you're burning, you're moving the router too slow. And um, if you're chipping, you're moving the router too fast. Those are kind of a general rule of thumb. So um, the other thing that can be, uh, that you can adjust, of course, is the speed of the router itself. And a lot of these have a variable speed on them. Um, this one doesn't, it's either off or it's on. And so the speed, the burn speed, has everything to do with your forward motion. And like with all power tools, it's really important to have a fixed velocity that you're moving along that cutting edge. You can't, you can't jerk and stop and go and stop and go or you're going to leave those tracks in the wood. So I'm gonna readjust this to take my second cut. And remove some more material. Now I don't know if you noticed that technique, but what I want you to observe that's going to improve the quality of your work is that as I use the D-handle router, I can hold this position and I pivot the router around the corner as my D-handle knob right here stays in a fixed position and that is going to help you a lot with quality. I'm going to go ahead and reset for the final cut. One thing you want to watch also, and you probably saw it right there in that video, is how close that power cord came uh, underneath. And a lot of times in cabinet shops, this is really kind of the preferred way of doing it, and that's because it gets that cord out of the way. So if you caught on to that, you were paying close attention. It is a little bit better technique-wise to throw the thing over your head and get it out of the way. I'm gonna make that second pass. Hopefully I can get rid of some of that burn by moving just a little bit quicker and you'll be able to see how to keep that cord out of the way. Well, 
I got a little bit of it out of there. But anyway, those are the techniques for using a larger D-handle router. One of the things uh, that I think has really improved the quality and safety uh, in chops today is a router table. And uh, they're really handy to use. It's almost difficult to make a mistake if you have them set up properly. The first thing you want to remember is that rub ring needs to be about a 64th of an inch uh, on this side of of your fence so that your piece um, actually rocks up just a little bit over it and rides that rub ring. That's going to keep your uh, piece so that you can keep it engaged with the profile a lot nicer. The other thing is that um, I like to mark these with feed direction. That helps users uh, do a lot better job uh, because if you were to come from this direction and the bit was going this way, then that board would come slinging back this way. I also like to cover my profiles uh, with this type of a guard which keeps keeps it so that it's much harder to get your fingers in there if you slip and have an accident and I like to use these anti-kickback uh, feather boards that uh, make it difficult to come back backwards once they're pressing down on that uh, work so you get you get the profile engaged much more consistently if you're able to push down on this piece of work across this table as it comes through here. The thing I like to tell people uh, also is that you don't want to you don't want to violate the blue, and so that's about a fist, and that's again always a safety margin uh, in my shop. And so we want to handle this piece in such a fashion that we're not uh, not going to be crossing over into. The, uh, the blue plate. And so another technique that will uh, work pretty nice for quality is if you do the end grain first. If you cut this end grain, spin this around, cut this end grain, and then come back and rip the profile on both sides, you're going to have a much better experience. It tends to tear out as it comes through the bit. The bit's going this way. There's not much to support it as it exits the wood. So I'm going to go ahead and fire this up. Okay. I'm going to make two passes each time I go through this uh, router table and the reason is because a lot of times you won't catch that maybe you've come away from the rub ring and that the profile then isn't perfectly straight as you pass through it. So I always tell people let's go ahead and make two passes on each cut that we make. So what you can see is that that, that that is absolutely a perfect cut with perfect depth and consistency all the way through there if you'll make those two passes on each piece that you make. The router table is far safer than using a hand router. There's a lot less that you can lose control of. And as you can see, this is a much safer setup than you would use um, if you were manually handling a router. So I'm at uh, the big router that has three and a half horsepower electric uh, motor on it. And um, one of the things that people can really take advantage of uh, in a shop uh, nowadays is to go ahead and make moldings. And uh, what I've got here is a bit for crown molding. And I want to show you how to stabilize it so that you can get very consistent results with using your crown molding. The first thing you have to uh, start, of course, start with is this large profile bit. The first pass that I'm going to make is going to be a regular, a relatively shallow pass through this cutter head. You can kind of see that just part of that cutter head is exposed. And the reason that you have to take shallow passes with this uh, tooling arrangement 
is because it exits it at such a steep angle and so it, it tends to pull chips away and I think that's one of the reasons why most people uh, have some results with this bit that they're disappointed with but uh, I'm gonna go ahead and fire this up So you can see that if you use a crown molding bit, uh, that you can do some absolutely fantastic work in the shop. And um, that's stuff that would have cost you a ton of money if you'd had to just go out and buy it. And uh, right in your shop with a router and the right bits and the right technique, you can produce the highest results uh, that uh, are available. So I hope you liked this video. If you did, click the like button and subscribe to the channel. 